Hey, deserving listeners, Darcy and Stacy, let's watch. Oh, so ready. So when he gets his work permit approved in a few months, he can start working right away to help out. Not going to do this alone. Show that uh, snatch jaw. Mm-hmm. Very nice. One more right here. Looking right here. And perfect. Hold that right there. Sexy, confident, fierce. Perfect. Right there. So the pod wife watched this episode before I watched it right now, and she couldn't help. Normally, she doesn't want to spoil it because I'm doing a reaction. I need things to be spontaneous for me. But she could not help telling me about this scene because the pod wife has been a professional model for many, many years, um, you know, 20, 30 years or something, a long time and uh, has been in a lot of these kinds of uh, situations. And she said that she was instantly <laughs> concerned, she used different words, with Stacy's, uh, ironically, the same name as my wife, uh, spelled differently without any, by the way, uh, but uh, with Stacy's commentary and all the things that she's saying, uh, <laughs> my wife, Stacy said that if I had done that, if I was there uh, uh, doing anything, let alone say, saying, do this, do that, that's good, that's good, that she would tell me to uh, F off or something. And, and I kind of get it because you're trying to work at, you're trying to work with a photographer. And apparently, according to Podwife, she is saying that it's mainly a relationship between the photographer and the subject or the model that they are trying to be in sync with each other and they need to be communicating a lot. You don't want this outsider just invading that, that verbal and emotional space. It wasn't our dream wedding, but we will one day get our dream wedding. We talk about it all the time. Cinderella moment. <laughs> 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 I think a little more movement, take the, kind of slowly take the jacket off, maybe pull the shirt, show a little abs. He's known for his abs. All right, now I know go to jail. Own it, baby, right, own here it. Here we go, right there, hold that. Now, I suspect for Stacy, there are two things going on. One is I think it's she feels it's her role to help people when she thinks they need help. I think with Stacy, they might have had that relationship with Darcy and Stacy, where Stacy was the one helping others and putting her own feelings aside. I th I've, I've been I seem to remember hypothesizing about that last season. So I think in this moment, she feels like Florian trying to get his career going in another country. She feels responsible. And when you feel responsible, then you, ha you, you try to do things because you're trying to help. I think the other issue I I'm guessing is that she is really desperate for him to have a career, probably for a few reasons. One, obviously, it would be nice to have another income, but also... I think she really wants him to enjoy his life here in the States because if he doesn't, then I think she perceives that, I think legitimately so, that that'll result in possible conflict in their marriage and or him wanting to leave the United States or him having mood issues and not treating her very well. So indirectly, but, but logically, a lot hangs on his success in this photo shoot maybe for for him and for her and their relationship. And that's increasing her anxiety, which is causing her to be uh, a, a little hyper in this moment and not thinking, hmm, I wonder if Florian wants me to do this. Do you need a tissue? No, no I'm good. Just moisturize your lips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't want to be a little stiffy. You're a little stiffy. Come on. Well, loosen up. Tag. Loosen up. Yeah. Babe, you're, you're a little stiff. Come on, we want to do more like. Do we miss it? Yeah. So sad. There you go. Rock with it, bounce. So I think this is the scene <laughs> that really drove my wife uh, bananas. This, uh, yeah. Uh, now maybe Florian is a little stiff. That's okay. He's, you know, he's getting comfortable. Maybe he hasn't done this in a while. He, he seems a, a little on the shy side anyway. And to tell a shy person, stop being shy, often makes them more shy or at least hurts their feelings and then makes them angry. So we've seen Florian lose his cool before. I'm wondering if he's gonna do it now. That's how All right. Um, so what you can do, you can throw your hands in your pocket, yeah. keep okay. your thumbs out, hold right there so we can keep the nice curve yeah. of the elbows. No, 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 no. Hold it. No, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. We need to show your abs. Put your forward. Oh, no, you're known for your abs. Trust me, I know what well, I'm this doing. This photo shoot is for me yeah. or for you? It's, it's, it's for us both. 
So one, why are you pushing this so much? Why are you so frantic for this to be a certain way? And two, he doesn't want to take his shirt off and you're going to force him to take his shirt off? Uncool. Uncool. Imagine if we reverse the genders, we would see this for what it is, which is a mild assault. I mean, I'm not, it's not, I don't know if it's criminal, but imagine if a husband said, no, no, you got to take off your clothes, you know, and, sh- and the wife's like, no, I, I don't want to do that right now. And, and hands on just taking off the clothes. Uncool. Chin down just a little bit. It's a little more body movement. That's what's stiff. Yeah. Chin down. Chin down. Chin down. Not that much. Just chin, right there. Chin down. Stays down. Enough. Enough. Here we go. You got to take direction. This is perfect. perfect. Shut your mouth. Too. Excuse me? Shut your mouth. You don't need to talk like that to me here. That's unacceptable. So I think he's starting to lose his cool a little bit. Now, what would be another way to communicate that? We use these shows as a jumping off point to think about our own lives and you're in a situation like that. Now it's going to be hard to be differentiated under those circumstances. You're maybe a little shy. You're a little worried. You're, you know, if you're Florian, you're in a situation where you're not speaking your native language and you're trying to make things work. And you're, you know, he's been giving her a lot of communication, a lot of indications, probably dozens, many of which maybe weren't even shown on the show. Uh, Stacy, please, you know, but he's getting to a breaking point, and uh, what could he say? Well, he could say, uh, hold on, uh, Stacey, can we talk? Uh, I'm really happy that you're <laughs> trying to help me, but I kind of have a process. You know, I've modeled before. I know you understand about modeling more than I do probably, but emotionally speaking, it would really help me if you weren't in the room right now. Just just let me let me feel this thing out. You know, it's, it's, it's a process for me. It'd be, I know it's... I know it might hurt your feelings, but could you just like not just go to the car, just take a walk around the block? I, I, I'm pretty sure me and the photographer, we're going to get into a rhythm, but it'd be great if you weren't here. <laughs> that kind of thing. Hug, a kiss, love you. Yeah, maybe something like that. Instead of shut your mouth. Here, because we were dealing with our own drama. But now that we're married. May stuff fly with you. No, it doesn't fly I with know. me. No, I you need to choose your words wisely, especially when other people are around in a professional <clears throat> setting. And I don't want that to happen on a real job one day. That can cost connections, and I need you to be the provider. There's a troubling dynamic seemingly developing, or maybe has been developed for a long time. And I think I remember speculating about this in the past. It's all coming back to me, of where she's more of the doting mother, the worried mother, uh, and he is more like an adolescent child, maybe even younger in terms of his role. It certainly has that vibe, doesn't it? And a lot of couples, particularly couples that have a lot of undifferentiation, will tend to bifurcate into these roles where one person is the parent and one person is the child. And we do this partially in my conceptualization because we're having trouble getting our needs met, we're having trouble communicating, we're having trouble trusting. We're having trouble knowing what we want. We're having trouble regulating our emotions. There's a lot of conflict. Sometimes it's actually uh, the lesser of two evils to actually bifurcate in this way because then everyone kind of knows what they're supposed to do. The adolescent is supposed to be quiet and reserved and do their own thing and talk a little snotty sometimes, but also be very compliant other times. And the other person, they know their role is to be very paternal and uh, critical and uh, invasive. And so everyone kind of knows what they're doing because they've, they've seen it in the past. And it's easy to slip into that. They don't really want that, but it's preferable to having straight on uh, relationships where Florian has to rise up to an adult-like status that might be very hard for him to do. And Stacy has to trust that he's going to do that. Uh, which is might be very hard for her to do. Because it's a big deal. Your first kiss is something you remember your whole life. My first kiss happened when I was 18. I was in college, and it was with a guy that liked to jet ski all the time. Actually, born too. He was like Spanish. Taught me how to use that tongue. Okay, so I always like learning about their histories, and people have speculated in the comments below, and I've wondered as well as to... 
if there are some factors we can point to as a conceptualization as to why both Darcy and Stacy are, uh, they have a track record of dating people from other places in the world. There's nothing wrong with that. We don't have to pathologize it. We don't have to figure out why someone does that. It's fine. There's, there's nothing uh, particularly strange about it. But sometimes we can look back on our histories and develop a conceptualization. We can never know because we don't have those technologies to, to measure those kinds of things right now with the brain. But we can develop a conceptualization, a theory, if you will, as to why we are the way that we are. And sometimes our initial relationships, our first romantic relationships, will imprint on us a certain uh, set of qualities that uh, might persist over time and define our type, if you will. Uh, it, it can evolve over time for sure, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of variance here. But it's possible that for Darcy, she just randomly, uh, her first person that she was uh, physical with, kissing, was someone from another country, and that imprinted on her a, a certain set of qualities that she now is, um, you know, her type, if you will. Who knows? Regardless of the sweet 16 or not, I just really feel like I know at certain ages, you know, you get these urges and sexual feelings. Oh, I mean, yeah. I just really feel like, you know, we should have that special talk, you know, like the birds and the bees. Okay, so this is actually a wonderful conversation that parents should be having with their kids. We tend to make jokes about this, like, oh, my God, it's so creepy when parents want to talk with their kids about this. It's very, very important. Why? I think it's pretty obvious, because if you don't talk with your kids about this, someone else will, and someone else is, particularly the internet is giving that information, and you cannot depend on these other sources of information to give them good information. Now, there are uh, sources that can be relied upon for good information, even on the internet, for sure, because the internet has a lot of information, particularly about sex, but it's very important that parents have conversations like this with their children, uh, starting early in life, and possibly for Darcy, she has wait, she's waited too long and the kids are now like, I don't want to have that conversation with you. Or that ship has already sailed this to a certain extent, but it's, it's never too late, I, I don't think. So she is doing that and that's great. Now, uh, often what will happen is the children will go like, oh my God, this is so embarrassing. You got to push past that. <laughs> I know it's embarrassing. But, you know, let's have a conversation. Now, you know, sometimes kids won't participate. And the, so what I've talked about with families before is that there are two kind of modes that you can go into. Uh, one is preferable over the other. One mode is where you eventually get to a place where there's a back and forth, where they might even come to you for information. Like, so this thing happened. Help me out with that. Uh, so that's where you're hoping for. And if you start early, then you're more likely to achieve that. Not necessarily all the time, but possible. Uh, the other, if you can't get to there and the kids are shutting down or they're embarrassed or they never really get past that, um, that shyness or that concern and they just lock you out, which teenagers will do sometimes, uh, then you go, you go into another mode. It's still an okay mode. It's where you're essentially just lecturing, <laughs> you know, which isn't great, but at least you can know that the kids are being exposed to some good information. So you say something like, and I would actually do this with kids uh, when I would treat them, not necessarily on the topic of sexuality, but, you know, a lot of teenagers will be forced into therapy and they don't really want to talk to you. And so one of the modes that I would go into was for me to say, you know, I'd really try to engage them, try to engage them, try to engage them, try to engage them, nothing works. And uh, maybe weeks, months into it, I just give up. I go, okay, well... It's clear you don't want to talk to me. That's fine. But I know enough about your situation where I think I can take some guesses and I'm going to throw some stuff out there at you. You don't have to take it, but, um, you know, we have an hour to kill. So you might as well just listen for me for the next five minutes and then we can play a game or something. And then I would just say what I hoped would be applicable information to them. Uh, thinking that at least someone is saying to them, maybe I'm planting a seed, maybe maybe some of this is getting in there. I could never really know, but that's another mode that I recommend parents get into. The reasons why I would propose these two modes is because parents in this situation, when they get pushback from the kids, they'll, they'll be like, oh, and then they'll run away, which I don't recommend. 
or they'll get mad and and they'll yell at the kids and say, you better listen to me. And of course, that's not optimal either. Condom. Yes. That's where they teach you how to put like a condom on a banana. No. What? Like, do you know how it works? Because, you know, they put it in the, the pee pee. Mom, okay. this is the worst conversation I have ever had in my whole entire life. Now, I always find this a little interesting because if you were talking with your daughters about uh, driving a car and safety on the road, uh, kids might not appreciate it because they're like, yeah, I know this mom, but they wouldn't consider it the worst conversation they've ever had in their life. But it's the same thing. You're just providing information. You're, you want to know that your kids are being safe and you don't want to just avoid it. You want to have a conversation. You want to, be, you want to know that they're okay. And you might want to tell them some things and, and, and educate them on some things, you know, 10 and 2 and, you know, blind spots and all that kind of stuff. And kids don't go like, oh, my God, this is the word. So why about sexuality do this? Well, because we live in a sex negative culture and we have tons of messaging that it's shameful and you're not supposed to talk about it, particularly with your parents. And you should not reveal to your parents about anything you're doing because – They'll shut you down or there's some religion, you know, involved in that. And so there's this heuristic that is uh, downloaded into children's minds and to some extent parents as well, that you should be ashamed. You should be ashamed to even have a conversation like that. And I think it's reflective of how backward our society is regarding sexuality because, you know, kids aren't born with this attitude. We uh, show them through our behavior that it's shameful to have a conversation like that. And then as a result, they're like, oh my God, this is the worst conversation I have ever had in my life. And that's unfortunate. When you guys, you decided, you know, having your horse, you know, sex, you guys are safe. So honor yourself, honor your body, honor your health. If they like you enough, they will wait. Period. Period. Too young to be a grandma. I know, and so, you won't be a grandma for a very long time. Thank you. Okay, so it's going pretty well. Uh, she, I think, went into a bit of the lecture mode, which was the only thing I think she could do because the kids weren't participating. And the kids are even uh, participating a little bit. Now, I think the if the if Darcy really wants to engender this kind of discussion between her and her kids, uh, she could do well by spending a little bit more time helping them to feel comfortable. You know, one of the other things that I've told parents to do is <laughs> you start off from the beginning and say, um, look, you might be uncomfortable with this conversation, but I'm not going to give up on it. Because sometimes kids will think, well, if I just deflect a little bit, it'll go away and I'll never have to deal with this again. But if you tell them from the beginning, until we have in-depth conversations about this, I'm not going to give up. So... I might, we might run out of time tonight because I'm just going to dedicate the next 30 minutes to this. But in, until you and I start having a dialogue about this thing, because it's very important and I don't trust the internet, I don't trust your friends, and I don't trust your school to educate you on the importance of body safety and sexual health and how to avoid being assaulted and how to think about yourself and how to have self-esteem and how to... Uh, you know, all the how-tos, all the things. Um, until I'm confident that you understand all those principles, I'm not giving up on this conversation. So don't think you're going to be able to deflect and avoid. I, I, I'm dedicated to this, kids. So that's another thing I would recommend parents do. It doesn't always work. You know, some kids, they just refuse. And that's one of the things that I would run into is like, one power that all children possess as teenagers particularly is the power of saying things. They don't have to say anything that they don't want to. They don't have to participate in a conversation that, 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 that they don't want to. And so you just have to do your best and hope that they can actually participate. Well, you can make it Makes your own. it more like stew. My mom and dad divorced when we were about 12 years old. We never really spoke too much about it because I think my mom was hurt by it, but my mom stayed strong and now they're good friends. It's really nice to see. All right. I always like learning about histories of the cast members and she is saying the parents divorced. We knew that when Darcy was about 12. I don't think I knew that detail and that they didn't talk about it much. So what does that mean? Does that mean that they talked about it sufficiently or does that mean that the family did not process it enough? As a family therapist, 
Very rarely would I be hired for this task. And when I was, I would commend the family for doing so. When a family goes through a divorce, it's there's so many things that need to be sifted through emotionally and practically. And I specialized to some extent in my early career on this issue just because I came across it so often of helping the parents to co-parent, helping the parents to communicate directly instead of through the kids, helping the kids to grieve the marriage uh, loss, working out the logistics of living in two different homes, making sure the connections are retained, making sure that the parents don't undermine each other. There is a lot of things to work out. And I would think that there's almost no way a family can navigate all those things in a healthy way, in an optimal way, without a family therapist helping them out with that. So anyway, it sounds like uh, there's a possibility that, according to Darcy, they didn't talk about it enough. There wasn't enough conversations around what does this mean, uh, not enough conversations with Darcy about how she felt about it, not en enough conversations about, um, you know, do you still love me? Because that's one of the things that kids will go through is, when they see their parents split up, there's this idea of, oh, so love is is uh, temporary. It can be temporary. People can break up with people. Does that mean you can break up with me? Even though they might not consciously feel that way, and even though you might reassure them, I'm never going to leave you, it is a notion that gets under kids' skin, even for adults, honestly. I've seen 25-year-olds have a lot of emotional difficulty when their parents will split up because of the you know the common reasons why children do. But anyway, so uh, I've always wondered where Darcy's schemas come from, where her issues come from, and it seems likely in part due to the divorce and the lack of conversation. And this for himself. We're givers, okay. DC. Both no, of us both are, and are. I'm a big giver. You're not Santa Claus. You're supposed to be his fiance. He should be looking to buy you something when oh, you're in a store. Can I mention the time when you found um, money stuffed in a sock, like he hides cash. What yeah. the So now I'm wondering, because we heard about the big fight that they had a couple months ago after the engagement, they were having an engagement party for Darcy with her friends, and she came home and uh, at least possibly intoxicated, but also in a different state and was really laying in to Georgie about various different things. They've recovered since then, but now the crew is back together and they are influencing Darcy. Now, maybe the friends and Stacy have points to make, I don't know. But they don't seem very strong points. Uh, the, the points that they're making are, you know, their general thesis is that he, he doesn't love her and that he's only in it for her money. And they point to two different data points. One is when they went into a store, he wanted to buy a fur jacket and she bought him a fur jacket. And the other data point is that he hides money, hides money in a sock. Maybe he just puts it there. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes you people put money in their socks for, you know, like, I know people that come from certain regions where there's a lot of pickpocketing. You might put things in your sock because you're less likely to be pickpocketed. I don't know. But those don't seem like strong data points that, one, he's only in it for the money, and, two, he doesn't love her. But that seems to be their condition. Now, maybe they're right. I don't know. Uh, maybe we'll find out over the season. Apartment. I was cleaning up and doing some laundry, and I was putting away some of Georgie's underwears and socks, and I happened to found a white sock with money in it. And there was about $1,400 in there. It was kind of hidden in the back, like underneath other items. All right, so that's a lot of money. And it sounds like there's really no other explanation other than that he was trying to hide it from her. Um, who knows? Maybe there's a rational explanation, and that's what she should do. She shouldn't just make up stories. She should go to him and say, why do you do this? Um, I don't know. I just kind of believe in Georgie. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe Georgie is some sort of psychopath or a terrible human being. But he, thus far, he seems to exhibit um, nice behavior and it, you know shows integrity. So who knows? Maybe things will change <laughs> over this season. It's not like that has, hasn't happened before in this show when I'm watching. But um, you know, maybe he hides it there because he is worried about the future. I mean, who knows? She should just go to him and ask him. So when I questioned him about it, he said it was, you know, to pay 
these credit cards. You know, it kind of surprised me. You know, usually you put money in a bank. I'd be damned if I ever found out my husband was hiding money. Yeah. That's a red flag. You need to know that, Darcy. I'm serious. Possibly, absolutely. But, uh, so she went to him and he said he, he has it there for credit cards. Now, if Darcy doesn't believe him, she should say, I don't, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Let's talk about this more. There's usually a reason. Now, let's say uh, that, let's live in a world where he actually does love her and does want to be with her. Uh, I think, you know, it's possible. It's also possible he doesn't. It could be, it's possible he's using her. Who knows? But, you know, money in a sock doesn't uh, point in that direction in a very firm way, I don't think. But anyway, so, but let's say that he is hiding money from Darcy because he is planning on leaving her or something or something something along those lines that would be a problem. Well, you know, that's a good conversation to have. It's just like, tell me, what's going on? How are you feeling? What's what's going on? Uh, but we haven't heard from him yet, so uh, maybe we will. I don't know how I'm going to get to the bottom of all these questions. I, I just don't seem like I ever get a complete answer. I don't know. Like, I... I just don't get married without knowing who this guy is through and through. All right, that's not bad advice. Don't get married until you're really sure about marrying him. Absolutely. Give it a couple years. That's a common, you know, give it give it 5 years. There's no rush. You can give it a long time. But we know that Darcy, I think, wants to get married ASAP. So that raises the intensity of the need to answer questions that might not be able to be answered in the short time that she's hoping for. All right, well, that does it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.